Hi, this is Nurse Inga, and today we are discussing some common women's health issues specifically related to perinatal nursing and education. One of our primary roles in nursing is evaluation of health and promotion of the person's ability to maximize or maintain their health status. The process of health promotion involves empowering people to increase control over their own health. Heart disease and cancer remain at the forefront of women's health issues, accounting for just under 50% of all deaths. In addition to teaching about a heart healthy lifestyle, the RN provides education related to reproductive cancer prevention, screening, signs and symptoms, and treatment. Sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, are infections that are spread through vaginal, anal, or oral contact. Chlamydia and gonorrhea are the top two reported STIs and are very prevalent in the adolescent female population. These can lead to fertility problems such as ectopic pregnancies and infertility. Unique factors that place youth at risk for STIs include lack of access, so insufficient screening, and not uh, actually accessing healthcare or seeing a physician or a provider, confidentiality concerns, so not being honest with their provider, biology in general, so young women's bodies are more susceptible to infection transmission, and then the lack of a consistent partner, so multiple partners increase the risk of sexually transmitted infections. Our elderly population, so a postmenopausal women and their male partners are also experiencing an increase in sexually transmitted infections. Education regarding sexually transmitted infections is aimed at reinforcing the need for barrier devices like condoms and dental dams. Even if uh, hormonal or IUD contraception is used in childbearing age patients and cervical cancer screening as well as STI testing needs to be done once the patient is sexually active. For our elderly population, they should still use barriers um, to guard against sexually transmitted infections even when pregnancy is not a concern. And we're seeing a rise in our elderly populations because uh, they're not worried about pregnancy. And we're seeing a rise in many of our youth because they have access to Plan B and so they're not worried so much about contraception. HPV is the most common viral STI in the United States. There are more than 100 strains of HPV. The low risk strains cause genital warts as you see here and they're these kind of soft, uh, pale, fleshy cauliflower, almost like growths um, that can be anywhere um, in the mucous membranes as well as on the skin. High risk strains cause cellular dysplasia that eventually leads to cancer. And the onset from dysplasia to cancer varies, but it's typically, you know, in the years range, like, you know, 5, 10, 15 years. Currently, HPV is identified as the leading cause of cervical, vaginal, vulvar, penile, anal, oral, and throat cancers, and that includes the back of the tongue and the tonsils. HPV vaccination is possible. Gardasil 9 guards against 90% of the strains that cause the genital warts and 70% of the strains that cause cancer. There are two other vaccines currently on the market that um, guard against fewer strains, but the Gardasil 9 tends to be the most common one that we use. The vaccine is most effective if it's given prior to becoming sexually active, so before there's any chance of HPV exposure. And we like to start at about age 11 or 12. It's two doses, six to 12 months apart, so one dose and then six to 12 months later the second dose, um, IM injection. And if uh, the person waits until they're 15 or older or sexually active to start the vaccination, then they get a total of three doses. Screening for HPV includes the pap smear because an abnormal pap smear is oftentimes related to HPV causing a dysplasia. 
and actual HPV testing because you can have HPV in places other than just the uh, vagina or the cervix. Cervical cancer is most often caused by HPV. It is screened for using the pap and out or pap smear, which examines cells from the cervix and the os under a microscope. Ideally, this should be scheduled roughly one week after the end of menses, so about 10 to 14 days after the start of a menstrual cycle, and the person should avoid intercourse for 48 hours before the exam to avoid any contamination or injury to the cervix. Nursing education for the patient includes information about the vaccine, the series itself, cervical cancer screening, and the fact that the vaccine does not prevent other sexually transmitted infections so that the person still does need to use barrier devices. Current PAP recommendations are every three years once sexually active or you reach age 21, and HPV testing starting at age 30, and PAP smears and HPV testing every five years once you reach age 40. And that's through age 65. And then once you're 65 years old, we often don't do pap smears anymore if you haven't had any abnormal pap smears because, again, it takes you know roughly 15 years from the time you have an abnormal pap smear until the time you develop cervical cancer. So at that point in time, you'd be at least 80 years old um, before you developed cervical cancer. Treatment includes things like the cone procedure, which is conization, the LEAP procedure, and cryotherapy, so removal or destruction of the cells on the surface of the cervix or the os. If the, cervix, if the cancer of the cervix sorry, is more invasive, then you would have to go for hysterectomy, and then depending on how invasive it was, also radiation and chemotherapy. Patients undergoing hysterectomy are at risk for complications related to anesthesia during the procedure, injury to the ureters, the bladder, the bowel, hemorrhage, infection, and deep vein thrombosis. And depending on which type of hysterectomy they have and whether it's vaginal or abdominal hysterectomy, um, then that also you know, changes kind of their risk factors and their recovery as well as you know, whether or not they're gonna have acute hormonal changes, like with a radical hysterectomy, when you have your ovaries removed, you might have acute hormonal changes as well. Postoperative management includes pain management, as this was major surgery, IV therapy to maintain hydration until the person can regain eating and drinking function, and then antibiotics if indicated. The patient should be NPO until gag returns, just like with other uh, post-op patients, and then progress the diet as tolerated over you know, the next 12 to 24 hours. Foley catheter remains in place for 12 to 24 hours with strict monitoring of INO, and then ambulation once the anesthesia wears off. You should really treat hysterectomy patients just like you would any other major abdominal surgery patient. Monitor for pneumonia. So you know, your interventions would be turn, cough, deep, breathe, incentive spirometer, listening to lung sounds. Monitor the incision site for signs and symptoms of bleeding and infection. Monitor the bladder and the urine output for signs and symptoms of a cauti. And then monitor vital signs and intake and output for changes or concerns. And, you know, if they go into shock from either an infection or a hemorrhage, they will have vital signs that will match that. Education includes uh, nothing in the vagina after the surgery until cleared by the physician. Um, so no fingers, toys, tampons, penis, douche, anything in the vagina, um, because you don't want to disrupt um, the suture line, especially, you know, if, especially if the cervix has been removed. But regardless, you don't want anything in there to injure the surgical site, typically six weeks. For the patient with uh, breast issues then, moving on from cervical issues, we know that there is no true prevention of breast cancer. 
we do know that people who know that they are uh, carriers of the BRCA gene have had things like radical bilateral mastectomies um, to avoid getting cancer. But, you know, for the majority of the population, there's no one thing that we can do to prevent the development of breast cancer. Screening includes screening mammograms. And we no longer do um, self breast exams monthly. So we don't teach that anymore. And we actually don't do annual clinician breast exams either. Those are no longer really recommended. Instead, it's recommended that if the person notes a symptom of breast cancer, that they report it and that gets evaluated. So if they see lumps, nipple deviation, or um, you know, dimpling of the breast, any discharge from the nipple, any redness or rash in the skin or changes in the skin, like the peau d'orange or the thickening of the skin, then those would be reported and um, kind of reviewed. But screening mammograms really are more accurate and uh, lead to better outcomes and earlier detection. If something is abnormal, then an ultrasound or an MRI to follow up on abnormalities and biopsy of any uh, lumps or nodes that are found. Typically, screening mammograms should be started by age 45. Women can elect to start at age 40. And if women have fibrotic or dense breasts or high family risk, then they can start even earlier. So some women start you know, in their 30s. The nursing role includes education about signs and symptoms of breast cancer and you know what to uh, report and when to report it as well as emotional support and education um, during screening treatment includes oncotype testing so that they can do very specific targeted um, treatment or therapy the correct treatment based on the type of cancer that the person has removing a lump, which is the lumpectomy, removing a portion or all of the breast, depending on the type of mastectomy that you have, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and targeted therapy. And again, oncotype testing is important because that tells you what type of cancer you have, and then they can best decide how to attack or treat it. The mammogram then, um, you know, we refer people all the time to have these. We either do screening mammograms or we do kind of um, a referral for a mammogram when somebody finds something. We should uh, tell the patient how important it is that they they can bathe that morning, but they should not put on any perfumes, lotions, deodorants, or powder in the armpits or on the arms or you know the breasts or anything like that, the skin area that day because it can cause shadowing within the mammogram and they could actually you know miss something so it's it's super important that um, they don't put any of that on their skin polycystic ovarian syndrome is an endocrine disorder that results in um, medical changes within the body that include things like type 2 diabetes metabolic syndrome cardiovascular disease elevated cholesterol, high blood pressure, an increased risk of cancers of the endometrial lining, ovarian cancers and breast cancers, infertility, abdominal obesity, and sleep apnea. Patients also develop things called hirsutism, which is facial hair development or hair on the face, the chest, the stomach, and the back. Ovarian cysts, so this, the ovary itself kind of becomes uh, filled with cysts, and it could be one or both of the ovaries, oily skin, acne, chronic pelvic pain, and hair loss in kind of a male patterned baldness. The role of the RN includes education of the risk factors, so especially the diabetes, the metabolic syndrome, the cardiovascular disease, the hyperlipidemia, the hypertension, um, you know, those are, those are pretty scary, and those can be life-altering or life-ending. And then assist with medical management teaching. So if the person's being placed on 
um, a specific diet or exercise regime or a new medication, or if they're diagnosed with diabetes, you're going to want to teach them about um, how to check their blood sugar, how to take you know their medication, or if, if they need insulin, how to inject their insulin. And then we want to really talk about the benefits of exercise because exercise in the patient with PCOS is uh, huge. It helps control the weight. It helps control blood glucose. It helps control blood pressure. It helps control cholesterol levels. It also promotes ovulation. So if they do want to be fertile, weight loss helps with um, fertility. Laser hair removal is an option, um, especially if there's, you know, uh, fe heavy facial hair growth or body hair. Referral to a dermatologist for skin issues like the acne. Weight loss um, and Clomid for fertility. So Clomid is a drug that helps stimulate the um, ovaries to release ovum. So we want them to release, you know, uh, eggs, not cysts. And then screening for depression and anxiety is important as well because this, you know, just emotionally can be a very difficult syndrome to live with. Menopause is when the person has a permanent cessation of menses. This usually happens somewhere between 35 and 58 years of age but the average is age 51. You're considered perimenopausal when you have four to eight years of irregular menses, and this typically occurs in your 40s. And many women will experience what's called anovulatory bleeding or a menstrual cycle after not ovulating, which tends to be very heavy, painful, and um, you know, clotty. Menopause then is, um, you know, when you have not had your menses for 12 months, so 12 months um, after the last uh, menstrual cycle, um, that's kind of the menopausal phase. And again, that averages at about age 51. And then postmenopausal is after that 12 month period um, when you've gone through menopause and uh, there aren't kind of hormones anymore like there were before. The signs and symptoms of menopause include things like irregular menses, the anovulatory heavy bleeding, hot flashes, uh, where the person has vasomotor responses to hormone fluctuations, night sweats, which are hot flashes while sleeping, sleep disturbances, um, so altered sleep patterns and insomnia, sexual dysfunction, which is a decrease in arousal and desire, vaginal dryness and atrophy, and pain with intercourse, and then psychological and mood changes like irritability, anxiety, lethargy, a decrease in energy, even panic attacks, forgetfulness, difficulty coping, and depression. They may also experience hair loss, food cravings, dry and decreased elasticity of the skin, weight gain around the waist and the hips, and palpitations. A couple things that are important about the kind of menopausal patient. Postmenopausal bleeding is scary for us because oftentimes that's endometrial cancer. So it's really important when someone is truly postmenopausal, if they report bleeding, it needs to be seen immediately and checked with an endometrial biopsy for endometrial cancer. During menopause, however, there's a lot that we can do to kind of help the person um, with their menopausal uh, symptoms. So this includes things like for hot flashes, avoiding um, caffeine and alcohol, cigarette smoking, um, hot or spicy foods, things that you know actually increase you uh, feeling hot. For night sweats, sleep in a cool room, maybe with a fan on, wearing cotton clothing and sleeping with cotton linens on the bed. For sleep disturbances, you want to maintain a good sleep hygiene, so have a sleep routine. Again, a dark, cool, quiet room. And don't eat right before bed so that you can have the best night's sleep possible. For sexual dysfunction, there are vaginal estrogens, 
There's water-based lubricants. And um, for psychological and mood, um, and exercise helps with that, as well as uh, therapy, uh, hormone treatment, acupuncture, biofeedback, hypnosis. Um, so there's you know a lot that we can do to help support the patient while they're going through menopause. One note about hormone replacement therapy is that we do know that any hormone replacement therapy that includes estrogen increases the risk of certain cancers, especially breast cancers. A note on our LGBTQ community and accessing care. Our LGBTQ community has extreme health disparities. They, they experience uh, increased risk of cancer, obesity, PCOS, osteoporosis, heart disease, substance use, and domestic violence. While they have a decreased likelihood of accessing and utilizing health care and resources, they're more likely to utilize alternative health care. And we think some of this is related to the fear of being kind of teased or ostracized um, or treated inappropriately by the healthcare team. Education and support are really critical in providing culturally sensitive and appropriate care. So provide good emotional support and then education on screening opportunities, immunizations, exercise, diet and weight management, smoking cessation, um, alcohol cessation, safety, and then risk reduction for osteoporosis. It's important as healthcare professionals, as nurses, that we offer quality care to all patients at all times, regardless of sexual orientation or identity. And that really is kind of social justice, right? That is one of our key goals um, in our profession. Intimate partner violence is physical or sexual violence, stalking or um, psychological aggression by a current or former intimate partner. And it's important to know that this often increases during pregnancy. There's a correlation with intimate partner violence and low birth weight babies, preterm deliveries, and neonatal death. People who are at risk for IPV include patients who have low self-esteem, low academic achievement, they're younger, they have substance use issues, limited support systems, and a partner with a history of violence. We should screen all people that we come in contact with for intimate partner violence. And we should watch for subtle cues that exist and those include overuse of the healthcare system with repeat visits for nonspecific complaints. They're scared, but they don't want to tell you. Vague, evasive histories or histories that don't really line up with what you're seeing for injury patterns. There may be a delay in seeking care, or they may even avoid care altogether for very serious injuries. Injuries are often hidden and in various stages of healing, so you may see bruising underneath clothing. And during pregnancy, bruising of the breasts and the abdomen are very telltale. And then a partner who hovers, who will not allow the patient to be alone, and who answers questions for them is a very giant red flag for intimate partner violence. So that was just a brief overview of some of the women's health issues that we may encounter in kind of the perinatal setting or if we're working in a primary care office that also does OB. As always, I thank you so much for watching and I love hearing your feedback. Have a great night.